Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the finale of the Final Fantasy XIII Trilogy. A trilogy whose greatness is dependent on whether the final game sucks or not. And who boy, it has been a bumpy ride. Five years dedicated to this universe. The only single-player campaigns that the franchise has been giving us for over half a decade. All while dangling Versus XIII, the game we really wanted to play, over our heads. Committing to a trilogy before the first game even came out was such a bonehead move on Square Enix's part, especially when you make the first entry the worst one. Doesn't really encourage people to want to try the sequels, you know? But hey, I gotta admit, I liked 13 too. I had a ton of fun with it. So now they got me by the balls. Because I gotta know how it ends, right? They're clearly listening to feedback, so maybe the final entry will be the best one yet. Well, right off the bat, the game becomes a freaking meme, because rather than call it 13-3 like we all expected, instead they called it Lightning Returns Final Fantasy 13. Lightning Returns. What is it with Square and their bizarre naming conventions? Bravely Default? Was Courageously Generic taken? Hey mom, for Christmas can Santa get me Kingdom Hearts 358 over two days? And now we have this title that makes it sound like Lightning is returning 13 to GameStop. I'd introduce myself, but I'm guessing that you already know who I am. It just feels so desperate, almost as if Square was worried that people weren't gonna buy it without reassurance. No, don't worry guys, you aren't gonna play as that dork Noel, you play as Lightning again! We promise! <laughs> It makes it sound like it's an in-between spin-off, rather than the important conclusion of the trilogy that it is. But whatever. The game had a rather interesting setup going in. Because yes, you play as Lightning again. And only Lightning. No extra party members, no monsters to control. She is the only character fighting in battles. And this game takes place in a small open world where you have to finish time-sensitive quests. You now have a time limit, and every action counts. Well, that's different. But hey, I went in with an open mind. The reviews were pretty good, and even the marketing was fun. They released this very cute trailer that's a recap of the last two games, only in 16-bit. It's 13, if it were Final Fantasy VI. Man, I wish this demake actually existed. Oh, it looks so much more fun. I was ready, man. Ready for the 13 trilogy to justify its existence. Let's end this thing with a bang. So come February of 2014, I got the game day one. And then 10 hours later, I quit playing and deleted the game from my hard drive. Because I hated it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know, I'm Mr. Negative again. Back in the Final Fantasy II video, I said that I only considered three of the games that I was going to cover as bad. The first was two. The second was 13. Well, we made it to number three. And I've been wanting to tear Lightning Returns a new asshole ever since the retrospective began. Ever since I ranted about it on Twitter over six years ago. Because for me, it was boring and pretentious and ugly, and every time you start to enjoy something, they find a way to ruin it. I was disappointed that, once again, Final Fantasy dropped the ball. At least, that's how I felt back in 2014. I never finished the game. This time around, I did see it through to completion, and I now have a much higher opinion compared to six years ago. Because what I didn't appreciate back then was the fantastic battle system. The combat is so unique and interesting, and customizing Lightning's abilities and appearance is super fun. I haven't had this much fun with battles since Final Fantasy X-2. And that is definitely something worth celebrating. It's just a shame that the rest of the game doesn't match that quality. The first 10 hours were still miserable for me to play, and although I warmed up to the game a little, it just kept reminding me why I quit in the first place. It's certainly still a better game than the original, but man, it could have been so much better. An unfortunate ending for the 13 Saga. As always, this video is going to feature full spoilers, how little there are, of everything in the 13 Trilogy. So if you want to go in blind and try these games for yourself, you might want to turn back now. 
For everyone else, let's end this dark stain on Final Fantasy's legacy. Because it's time for Lightning to return. So when we last left off, the world was absolutely fucked! Purple Man Caius was tired of seeing the woman he loved die over and over again, so he vowed to kill the goddess Etro, the one being who was keeping a mysterious energy force contained in the spirit realm of Valhalla. During the ending of the first game, this chaos force managed to seep out a little and sucked up our protagonist, Lightning. It dragged her to the Unknown Realm, where she eventually came into contact with Etro and became her guardian. Having the ability to see everything that has or will happen in history, she used her new position to recruit her sister Sarah and a hunter named Noel. Together, they would defeat Caius and prevent the apocalypse. Yeah, about that. Turns out, the heart beating in Caius's chest was the Heart of Chaos, and it is literally the living personification of Etro. So when it died, she died. With the timeline screwed up, Sarah, who was receiving fatal visions as a seeress, saw her last and died in Noel's arms. And then the living world merged with Valhalla, releasing chaos and entropy everywhere, thus eliminating the concept of time. As for Lightning, having failed to protect Etro and her sister, she entered into a deep sleep as her body crystallized atop Etro's throne. And she would stay in that sleep for over 500 years. Yes, everyone but Lightning has been living their lives for five centuries since the last game ended. With the concept of time gone, nobody dies of old age. It also means that anyone who was a child still has the body of a child all these years later. And if you want to be a parent, well, that's unfortunate, because no new life can be born. Everything is stuck in a perpetual stasis. Well, kind of. The sun still rotates around Grand Pulse, giving us day and night cycles. Clocks are still in use and will tell the time. It's just more like people can't grow, I guess? But they also specify that people still have to sleep and eat food or else their bodies will wither away. But like, why would that be affected? Old age is degradation. I mean, if I lift weights, will I even build muscle in this universe? Nothing's supposed to grow. And another thing. It just raises too many questions. Whatever, the point is, everyone is 500 years older. Lightning's been sleeping all this time, until she gets a very special visitor. One day, the light touched me. I knew what it was. It was God himself, speaking to me. Yep, capital G-O-D. The grand creator of the entire universe has blessed Lightning with his presence. And he's looking for a warrior. He told me what I had to do. I would be his servant, and if I succeeded in doing his bidding, my reward would be a miracle. He said she would live again, my sister, Sarah, and I'd have her back at last. So ever since the Chaos Force appeared, it's been slowly but surely destroying everything in its path. Grand Pulse is on its last legs. The only location left intact is a small island known as Nova Chrysalia. An island that seems to have been named after the Fabula Nova Crystallis project. What the hell is that? Oh, don't worry, you'll find out in the 15 video. Anywho, it's the end of the world as we know it. The Chaos Force is going to consume Nova Crystallia and thus all life on the planet. God, who goes by Buna Velza, has decided to finally get off his ass and begin the rapture. He plans to transfer the souls of Grand Pulse to an entirely new planet of his own creation, thus ensuring that humanity survives, leaving the chaos behind. A cosmic do-over. A fresh start. However, God works in mysterious ways, and although he delivers messages, assembles computers, and plants giant life trees, he's still asleep and can't actually collect everyone's souls by himself. And that's where lightning comes in. You're the savior. It's a simple role. You have to rescue as many people as you can from this world and lead them to the new one. I scratch God's back and he gives me what I want. My sister. And yes, that is Hope telling her all this, because he's also been recruited by God. And for some reason, he's been de-aged back to a teenager. But that's not all that's different. God is using my dead sister as a bargaining chip. Something like that should infuriate me to no end. But... For whatever reason, I don't feel angry. I think I know what you mean. I'm the same way. Maybe that's how God wants it. 
Maybe emotions and his servants just distract us from what we're supposed to do. So he got rid of them for us. Maybe he did. And maybe returning me to childhood was part of his plan too. But we can't expect to understand everything he does. Uh-huh. God's gonna be the final boss, isn't he? <laughs> but yeah, this is the setup for Lightning Returns. As the savior, Lightning must go down to Nova Chrysalia and collect as many souls as she can before the world ends. And to help her accomplish this, God has imbued her with the ability to absorb Aradia. Aradia being the soul energy of every living thing. The more souls she saves, the more powerful she becomes. However, it's not as easy as just walking up to people and taking them. If someone's spirit feels unfulfilled, if they're hanging on to their despair and regret, then they can't open themselves up to move on to the new world. So you know what that means. Lots of side quests where lightning helps people with their problems. I mean, unless it's the opening cutscene where somebody forgot about that. Your soul is mine. No! Fatality. And wouldn't you know it, we need to collect the souls of our friends as well. The gang's all here, Zaz, Noel, Snow, even Vanille and Fang, who have finally woken from their crystal slumber. If you want to see the ending, you have to save them all. Well, just the important ones anyway. There are thousands of people down in the world waiting to be saved, but you cannot help all of them. It's not possible. This will sound cold, but you need to be efficient. You're saying I shouldn't waste time on helping the hard cases. I've got to pick and choose who gets saved. The time spent helping one person might be better spent saving the souls of ten others. A numbers game, like you say. Control costs and maximize profits. Our savior, ladies and gentlemen! But hey, this is something that makes Lightning Returns stand out. The game has an actual time limit. Like in Final Fantasy VII, the world was threatened by a giant meteor that was slowly falling towards it. But in reality, you could spend as much time as you wanted doing side quests, grinding levels, or playing games at the Gold Saucer. It was just the background of the plot. There wasn't any urgency for the player to do things quickly. This time around, oh no, there is a clock. It tells you how many days are left, and aside from the pause menu, cutscenes, and battles, it's always counting down. You can't dilly-dally in a dungeon, lest you waste too much time. I imagine this will probably turn off a lot of players. Because this means, theoretically, you're not allowed to stop and smell the roses. It's hard to notice details about the world when you're constantly sprinting to a destination for maximum efficiency. Personally, I'm not against the concept, and I actually enjoy quite a few games that do this. Dead Rising, Pikmin, Way of the Samurai, maybe? Do you even know what that is? I kind of like the pressure of having to complete every single goal I can as efficiently as possible. I don't want every game to be like this, god no, but as long as it's thoughtfully done, it can be a pretty enjoyable time. And how is Lightning Returns' time limit? Well, I managed to get every important soul required for the ending in about six days. To put that into perspective, the game ends after 13 days. I wasn't even halfway. Though I did extend the clock a little by spamming a time-freezing ability called Chronostasis throughout the run. Even still, for my first playthrough, I think that's pretty good. Most people would agree that there's plenty of time and you shouldn't stress out about it. Though you won't know that on your first playthrough, and that can lead to some frustration with the game's design. But I'll get to that in due time. Instead, I want to focus on the positives first. And the best part of Lightning Returns, by far, is the game's new battle system. You guys know how I felt about the last three Final Fantasies. Automation, to me, is incredibly boring, mindless, and it takes away from the experience. Because when a game puts you into thousands of battles, you don't want to watch it, you want to play it! You want to absorb enemy strategies and plan out your moves and manage inventory and just... You want to be engaged, you know? So I went into this one kind of intrigued because you only play as one person, and the paradigm shift system doesn't really work well that way. So, that means they're going to have to change it up. And boy howdy, they do. So in your first battle, you start off with a command list, where each ability is tied to one of the four face buttons. And we start off with Thunder, Attack, and Guard. And the second you push any of these buttons, 
Lightning will immediately perform them. No buildup, no charge time, just instant results. And the inclusion of a guard button certainly implies that there will be specific timing to actions. Because when the big scary Anubis monster goes to swing his axe at me, I block in the nick of time and clang! I reduce the damage done to me. I say nick of time because you don't want to guard too long. For every second that you're holding that shield up, you're using the ATB gauge. When you keep attacking the monsters with sword slashes, eventually you're going to run out of energy to perform these moves. But waiting for the ATB to refill on its own is glacial. It's so slow and the enemies will never stop attacking. So what do I do? Well, that's where the schemata comes in. You don't have party members, but what you do have are different combat costumes. With a push of the shoulder button, I can transform Lightning from her default savior garb to her Dark Muse outfit. Not only does this change her costume, it replaces Thunder with Blizzard, and it offers up a completely fresh ATB gauge. Each costume has their own ATB meter, and while I'm fighting as the Dark Muse, the ATB of the savior garb is quickly filling back up. This encourages you to constantly change forms. As long as you're always cycling through all of the schemata, you never have to wait for gauges to fill. This keeps the battles fast-paced while maintaining the intimacy of fighting by your lonesome. Seeing Lightning's outfit change will probably bring back flashes of Final Fantasy X too. So you think, oh, this game has a job system. Eh, kind of? I would say it's more of a distant cousin to the job system because it's not as restrictive. Abilities in this game are actually items you collect. Sometimes you kill an enemy and hey, I just got the blizzard spell. Sometimes you open a treasure chest and boom, I now have D protect. And you can assign any of those abilities to any garb that you want. At no point am I unable to cast magic, unable to debuff, unable to block things with my shield. What's unique to a schemata is their stats, passive skills, and they usually have one locked ability that you can't change. So it's not a question of which garb will let me use magic, instead it's which garb will work best with my magic. Some schemata have better physical strength, some have higher health bars, some have better agility which means a faster ATB gauge. You only get to equip three costumes for battle, so you have to choose wisely. And boy oh boy, you have a lot to pick from. How many costumes would you think there are? 10? 15? Why not shoot for the stars and say 20? Well I'm sorry, you're aiming way too low. Because Lightning Returns actually features over 70 outfits. 70! Although I'm not including downloadable content, which would easily add another 15 to the list. Somebody really liked playing dress up. You're just constantly unlocking new schemata, whether at the clothing shops on every corner or from completing side quests that hand them out like candy. There are very few repeat designs, and that's impressive, I gotta say. These outfits aren't just limited to battles either. Whatever you equip will be seen in the overworld and in cutscenes. This game can be as serious or as goofy as you want because you have total control over Lightning's appearance. You look absolutely beautiful. You're like an angel from heaven. I heard this place serves a mean steak. This fucking rules. You'll have to indulge me, but early in the game, I managed to find an outfit known as the Velvet Bouncer. The Bouncer. If you know anything about me and the kind of custom characters I create, it's that I love a good business suit. Unfortunately, I'm not really into purple. It's just not my color. Well, guess what? Lightning Returns also has a color editor. No shit, you can change the colors of every single outfit to look however you want. What was purple is now green. What was green is now pink. Why be a boring regular savior when I can be a savior who supports trans rights? I live for customization like this! So for the rest of the video, every time you see Lightning rocking a fancy suit and some killer shades, that's all me, baby. It's my video, my playthrough, my Lightning. Now you're going to want to prioritize stats and battle capability over appearance, but hey, you can always have a build that relies more on equipment and accessories than the actual garb itself. It's just fun that if I want Lightning to appear as a red mage, I can. If I want her wearing the original Guardian Core outfit, I can. 
a medieval demon lord, a treasure hunter, a soldier brat, a cat girl wearing glasses? Well, you got your hands on a rare garb. The Makote are a legendary race said to live in another realm. If I recall, the land they're said to inhabit the legend is called Eorzea. Sounds like a cool place. We'll find out what's up with Eorzea next time. Now, I would be remiss not to mention the fan service outfits as well, because sometimes you go into a clothing shop and, whoa, Nelly, where are your pants, young lady? At the end of day six, I returned to the Ark and found a new costume waiting for me, delivered by God himself, the Amazon Warrior. I put it on and, oh my, Buna Velza! This outfit is so revealing that in cutscenes, you can actually see Lightning's ass crack. Jesus Christ, Square Enix! Go to horny jail! Do not pass go! Do not collect $200! And speaking of money, fan service also comes in the form of DLC. Because you can download extra costumes to make Lightning become other Final Fantasy heroes. Yuna from Final Fantasy X, Aerith from Final Fantasy VII, and then there's the creme de la creme. You can look like Cloud Strife, complete with the Buster Sword and everything. The transformation is complete. So yeah, I'm a huge sucker for customization. And the fact that you can tweak the colors and put on tiny adornments like hats and masks and stuff just makes it all the better. Because if I have to play a game that I don't think is all that fun, well, at least I look good doing it. But again, I think the battles are fun. Although I didn't initially feel that way when I first played the game. When you go into battles, you can only equip three different schemata, which means that in total, you have 12 abilities that you can use during combat. Because when you junction abilities to your costumes, it's always in service to one of the four face buttons. With every command being a single button press away, this streamlines the experience. I'm not going to be navigating slow giant menus just to select poison five times. You know, the thing auto battle was a band-aid for? I've got everything I need right in front of me. Well, not everything, as preparation really matters here. Because think about what you use most in RPGs. The basic attack skill is a given, and that's not an automatic thing. And you know, I'm going to be blocking attacks with my shield, so I want every garb to be able to do that, right? Well, if that's how I set it up, I've used half of my possibilities. Six of twelve skills just dedicated to attacking and guarding. And that's not even keeping in mind that every costume you equip has one locked ability. If I want to equip the Mist Wizard, I have to have Thunder. I can't get rid of it, it will always be part of the repertoire. So if I'm choosing costumes that don't have attack or guard as its locked ability, then I only have three ability slots left. And that sucks because I have so many abilities I want to use. I want to poison people, I want to lower their physical defense, slow them down. I want to take advantage of every elemental weakness they have. Not just for the damage, but because doing so exploits weaknesses which also help stagger enemies. Yep, we still have a stagger system and it's very helpful in winning fights. And maybe I want to do an AoE skill like Blitz, so I can hit every target when I get surrounded. I could replace attack with Blitz, but then again it uses up more ATB. So all of a sudden I'm draining the gauge way faster than I did before, and the other two schemata haven't had enough time to refill theirs. So now I'm feeling vulnerable, and I might need to wait and do nothing for a bit, but oh god, they keep attacking and I'm still taking damage even though I'm guarding, and ah, oh, my anxiety! <laughs> it was actually pretty stressful at first. And full disclosure, I played through the entire game on normal mode. One of the big differences of playing easy mode is that your health will refill after every battle, just like it was in the first two games. This time, however, if you get your ass kicked and manage to survive, you're still going to be barely hanging on when the battle's over. And if this were any other game, I'd just heal myself with the cure spell and be back to normal. But Lightning Returns does not have cure magic. Yeah, no cure, no cura, those spells are just gone now. The only thing you can do to restore your health is drink a potion from your limited inventory. Six slots. You only have six slots when the game boots up. Even the original Final Fantasy was more generous than that. You don't look so good, Light. What? Drink a potion or eat some food to recover your health. Oh, just eat some food! Why didn't I think of that? 
I'll just grab some pancakes off of the pancake tree. And while I'm at it, I'll go ask these critters if they have any pizza. Hope, you dumb motherfu- Anywho, needless to say, this game can be pretty challenging. After the last video came out, I actually had tons of people warning me to play Lightning Returns on easy mode. As if I couldn't handle it! I did not play on easy mode. I wanted to understand this game's mechanics. I mean, I shit talked the original game's battle system, but I still got tons of 5 star rankings. I knew how to play, and I still thought it sucked. The game definitely starts out pretty hard, but for me there was a turn when I took on my first boss fight. I went up against Noel in Luxurian, and although it wasn't a train wreck of a fight, it still ended with a 1 star ranking. Damn. I had to know what I was doing wrong. The one thing I kept thinking about was that I was still taking damage despite blocking attacks. And this isn't a full-on action game. I can't move around and dodge things like Aya Bria in Parasite Eve. I'm not Sora from Kingdom Hearts. I am the sole target in every single fight and they're always gonna hit me with stuff. It would be so much simpler if I was actually negating damage, because then this game could just be about timing. Knowing when to go on the offensive, when to stop and protect myself, paying attention to enemy movements, and acting accordingly. I wouldn't need to worry about my health if I wasn't losing it. And I know it's possible, because in the prologue, I was actually blocking damage. I wasn't seeing numbers, I was seeing guard. So I glance at lightning stats. Strength, magic, EP, HP, ATB, none of this has anything to do with defense. The only thing that controls that is your shield. Now when you set up a schemata, you're also picking out a weapon and shield for those costumes. And I was prioritizing equipment that raised my strength and magic because I was more into hitting hard and ending fights quickly. Plus it really doesn't help that in the top right, it shows all the things that are changing except for guard defense. And there really should be an icon for that as it is the most important thing. But as I think about it, I realize only one of my shields has great armor, but I can't equip it to all three costumes, so it doesn't really matter if the other two guard. Hmm... It doesn't matter if the other two guard. This train of thought changed the whole game for me. I made it so only one schemata would guard, and it would be a pure defensive build. It would exist to complement both my physical and magical setups. I would go into shops paying attention to the guard defense modifier and upgrade when appropriate. And just like that, all the enemies who were giving me so much shit were now barely scratching me. Look at that beautiful word. Guard. Guard! I was worried that keeping guard to one costume might make the combat a little awkward. Because now I have to remember to switch my schemata every time I want to block an attack. I'm not just pressing X. Now it's the right trigger, then X. But this was actually fine. The speed at which lightning transitions from one roll to the other is instantaneous. There's no delay at all, it just feels like you're extending a combo chain. And there is a benefit to having guard on a separate ATB meter. No longer will I be slashing an enemy, draining all of my gauge, and then foolishly decide to block an incoming attack on that same bar. Because I only used my defense build to guard and debuff, it always had energy whenever I needed it. And yeah, I had debuffs! With the freed up ability slots, I could deep attack, deshell, and poison just as any fight would begin. And they always stuck! It's not like the original 13 where you had to shoot poison 10 times because debuffs were fickle. Here, you shoot once and it just works. The combat is so much more engaging because you're always reacting to things. This game still uses a lot of the same enemy types with the exact same character models and everything. But now, instead of just switching to a dull sentinel class which makes you steel guard for 10 seconds, I'm actually paying attention to their animations. I'm checking to see if the behemoth is about to swipe at me. I'm avoiding some of Snow's stances because I don't want to get countered. This bird hits multiple times, so I keep blocking until it's done. I'm actually paying attention to enemy moves rather than my health bar. It has this really fantastic ebb and flow to it where I start the fight debuffing, I get in there and fuck them up, they start to attack and I cool off to block it, and then I get back in there and fuck them up some more. I got so adept at the combat that I finally achieved the validation I seeked. Five star rankings, baby. Not just on normal, but even in the new game plus hard mode. So yeah, I think I figured it out.
Now that being said, I did have an issue with the camera, as well as the abundance of special effects that overload your eyeballs. Because Jesus Christ, sometimes there is just too much going on! You swing your sword, there's a light effect. You change your schemata, your body glows white. The enemy shoots wind, shoots ice, it lingers on screen. Sometimes other enemies get in front of the camera and you can't see what you're doing! And God help you when you get into one of the boss fights, which love to change the camera on you. Let's do this. You hear that clanging in the middle there? That was me guarding, even though lightning wasn't on screen. The first time I played this, I thought it was just build up. I was waiting for the camera angle to change so I could visually see the tornado connect with lightning. But no! I got stunned and flung in the air and I took a lot of unnecessary damage. Something that's also going to happen when you fight multiple enemies. Because you only really focus on one target at a time, that means sometimes you get blindsided by an attack you couldn't see coming. To avoid taking damage, you find yourself anticipating the off-screen. Unless they're doing a special move, in which case you'll see a text box pop up in the corner. Again, you gotta pay attention. If I didn't notice that tiny little box that said Rush, I wouldn't have known what was coming. And sure, it shows foresight that there's even a text box at all, but it still feels inelegant. I'm just saying, if the game's frame rate wants to die every time the Sahagan attacks me, you might be doing too much. I also have other nitpicks, like certain mechanics not being given a tutorial. I had to read the giant glossary of battle terms just to discover that I could actually slowly walk lightning around and break off enemy body parts. Is this news to some of you? Because you can do that! With certain enemies, the giant robots especially, that knowledge could have given me a huge amount of relief. But then again, I rarely wanted to experiment with this because monsters are always facing you, unless they're stunned from a stagger. If lightning moved faster, maybe I'd try to hit them from different sides more often. But going around them is slow, so I'd rather not waste my opportunity. But hey, not knowing about this mechanic didn't ruin the game for me. Neither did the camera or the special effects. At the end of the day, this is still a really fun battle system. The most fun I've had since Final Fantasy X-2. I just really appreciate the engagement. I actually had to pay attention to my item supply. I actually had to think about which abilities I wanted to use. And I couldn't just brute force my way through every battle. On normal mode, it is so easy to get curb stomped and tossed around like a plaything. Here I'm studying the way enemies fight, and I'm actually learning their weaknesses. I'm not on autopilot, and I couldn't be more thankful. It's great. The only thing is... There's an elephant in the room, and that elephant is that Lightning Returns is an action RPG. The game is so fast-paced. You're constantly switching costumes, hacking and slashing enemies, defending against a barrage of different attacks. You don't do that in a turn-based game. You do that in Revengeance. If you like the Super Nintendo games, the PlayStation games, 10, 10, 2, this game plays nothing like those. If you were expecting that, I actually wouldn't recommend this. Personally, I'm fine with action RPGs in isolation, and I've enjoyed plenty of spin-offs like Final Fantasy Adventure and Crystal Chronicles. But this is a little more controversial, because this is where the series starts to turn. This is the beginning of the end of the traditional Final Fantasy. Eventually, I'm going to cover 15, 7 Remake, and the upcoming 16, and those entries are damn near unrecognizable from the series' legacy. The transformation started here. I did have fun, but man, I feel a little guilty about it. But this is a topic for another day. For today, for right now, Lightning Returns' combat is the best thing about the game. But we're not just battling monsters, are we? No, this game has a giant open world to explore and tons of quests to do. It's the most substantial part of the game, and I'm only now talking about it 30 minutes in. Sorry, I just really wanted to get the good stuff out of the way first. <sighs> Where do I even begin? I guess the incredibly boring opening is a good place to start. And I don't mean the palace scene, that was a perfectly fine 20-minute tutorial. But once we get acquainted with the plot, with God, with Lightning's mission to save everyone's souls, we get dropped into the city of Luxurian. Right off the bat, we find that there has been a murder. 
A cult that calls themselves the Children of Etro has been murdering girls with rose-colored hair. Because to them, Buna Velza is a false prophet, and they really want to kill his appointed savior. And you discover all of this by agreeing to help out the lead investigator, a man whose hairstylist clearly hates him. So you're doing detective work, checking the scene of the crime, examining clues, and talking to everyone in the area for eyewitness accounts. Everybody's fully voice acted, and you have to talk to like 10 or 15 people to know what's going on. For me, the investigation went on for a solid 20 minutes, and I thought it was fine, if slow, world building. It intrigued me with the mention of a shadow hunter, and it was kind of neat starting the adventure with a person dead and bloody in the street. Not a bad way to hook me in. As soon as you solve the murder and tell the Inquisitor, he gives you his soul, and then the game gives out a tutorial about energy points. EP is a very special commodity. Not only can it slow down enemies during battles, not only can you use it to teleport around Nova Cursalia, not only can it open special locked chests with exclusive treasures, but the most important thing I used it for was to activate chronostasis. By spending one EP, of which you start off with five, you can temporarily stop the countdown and buy yourself extra time. Remember, the world is ending. Every minute that I was doing detective work, the clock was counting down. If I can't solve everyone's problems before then, the game's over. And on a first playthrough, I don't know how tight that time limit is. So naturally, I activated chronostasis as often as I could. And boy, what a shitty time to give me that tutorial. As soon as the murder quest ends, Hope doesn't tell me what I need to do next. Which is surprising, because for the entirety of the investigation, he wouldn't shut the fuck up. It looks like someone's targeting the Savior. May the holy light if you see any people who need help, lend them a hand. That was a valuable witness statement. That's vital information. The Inquisitor will definitely be very interested in this information. The Inquisitor will definitely be very interested in this information. The Inquisitor will definitely be very interested And no, in this you can't turn him off in the options. But when this quest ended, nothing. Hope had nothing worthwhile to say. Now, I didn't have many options. The city's on lockdown, the trains aren't running, and gates are keeping me from the rest of the area. The most significant development was that shops opened up after talking to the Inquisitor. And since none of the cult members were walking around in the square, I assumed that I had to talk to the shopkeepers to find out where they were. And while I did buy some stuff, no, they didn't tell me anything. So I wandered. I looked in every nook and cranny, talked to as many people as I could, and nothing was happening. My chronostasis would run out, I'd activate it again, and eventually I wasted a solid 20 minutes and decided to open up the map. Because maybe I'm missing a hidden pathway or something, and, uh... From midnight, trail heretics near the station. What? Nobody said anything about midnight! I rewatched my footage for this video, and I'm telling you, there was no specific time frame given. I just assumed that when the quest ended and the screen faded to black to shuffle the NPCs around, that the fucking cult would show up. Where were you on that one, dipshit? Also, here's an idea. Don't give me chronostasis until after the cult shows up. One little miscommunication and I waste 20 minutes as well as my EP. Great. And what am I even doing? perched on top of a tower, spying on dudes in white robes? When did Final Fantasy become Assassin's Creed? Alright, oh, how could I forget? After following the cult, the game finally opens up. The gates go away, the trains start running, and you can actually go to any of the four major locations that Nova Chrysalia has to offer. Thanks to its open-world design, you can actually clear any of the major quests in whatever order that you want. Wanna catch up with Snow? Go to Yusnan. Wanna stay in Luxurian? By all means! But I gotta say, this is one of the most awkward moments for the game to open up. In-game, it's like 1 in the morning. That means that the city locations are incredibly dark, empty, and have nothing interesting to offer aside from shops to buy equipment from. You're not going to see any cool side quests, and the main quests cannot progress until day 2. Sure, these cities look cool, but for the next real-life hour, I'm not going to be doing anything. And even if you're just looking for monsters to fight, the game gets unbalanced at 4 a.m. Because at 4 a.m., every single enemy out in the wild gets replaced with a Mio Necton. When you start a new game, they have really high attack and defense, which makes fighting them tedious and time-consuming. 
Why is this guy so hard? What is going on with this fight? That was just a normal guy? So I just went to go look up how to fight that guy. It literally says in this guide, avoid on day one. Are you kidding me? And considering that taking the train always drains an hour from your countdown, you're gonna be fighting them sooner rather than later. Why start the game late at night when the battles are too challenging and there's nothing to do? Why wouldn't you have the adventure begin with limitless possibilities on a bright sunny day? I just don't get it. They also don't set up the world very well. Yeah, I can go anywhere I want, but I don't know anything about this island. Hope is constantly operating from this giant computer and he doesn't have the decency to give me a PowerPoint presentation. Come visit the expansive wildlands, home to the whitest cock you've ever seen. Anyway, every day really begins at 6 a.m. When the clock reaches that time, lightning always gets summoned back to the Ark where Hope is. Oh, by the way, the Ark is actually New Cocoon from the last game, which, if you remember, was actually called Buna Velza by Hope. It was named after God, apparently. I actually like the fact that you get called back to the Ark every day. Not only does your EP refill, but Hope sends you back however you want. You can return to the exact spot you were when you got called up, or you can travel freely between any of the four major locations. It meant I could spend day two exploring the Wildlands, and then day three with the Dead Dunes, always giving me a quick teleport to stay fresh with the resets. Now, being the empathetic, naive bastard I am, I chose to start day two back in Luxurian. Girls are being murdered by some sick fucks. I want to lock this down ASAP. If we don't figure it out by tonight, another girl will be sacrificed. I don't want that on my conscience. So here's the setup. The cult that have been murdering women are hiding inside the cemetery. However, the gates are closed and apparently the fucking church which runs the city doesn't actually have any authority to open it. The gates only open at midnight when a person responds to a phone booth caller with the correct four-digit code. 7891. Oh good, we just heard the code. <sighs> I wish. They change the answer every day and spray graffiti numbers around town so that the cult can find them and ascertain the solution. Naturally, we have to as well. And Luxurian is a really big place. If you wanted to explore the entire thing, fight monsters along the way, check out every nook and cranny, I mean, there's gotta be something in the church, right? It takes like a solid 25 minutes just to go through it. That's a big chunk of your time just to fight, I don't know, three battles, listen to dozens of voice acted conversations, check out dead ends that don't pay off, I did one pass through the city and only found two numbers, so clearly I missed something. I do another pass. Keep in mind I'm also starting side quests, but hold that thought, because boy, that's another can of worms. I end up finding a third number, so hey, I clearly did miss this one, but there's still one left. So I do another sweep, and it's here I start getting frustrated. Like, this number just isn't here. I have spent the better part of an hour just walking around the same map that I've been stuck in since the game began. This is so boring. Could something happen? The church can't possibly be a dead end. There has to be something. Why is this pathway so fucking long if nothing's here? Maybe I wouldn't be so agitated if there wasn't a constant ticking clock reminding me how much time I'm wasting. I have nothing to show for it. Three numbers and a lot of unresolved quests. And these quests are very important. Why? Because collecting people's souls is the only way you grow lightning stats. You heard correctly. When you defeat monsters in battle, you do not get Christogen points. There is no Crystarium. You do not get experience points, this game does not have levels. You get money, loot, and tiny bits of EP. That's it. The only way to hit harder, to run faster, to be healthier, is to finish quest lines and earn people's finite souls. You know Square Enix, if it ain't broke, they smash it to pieces. The quests you get in Luxurian are just terrible. Right off the bat, I find this girl lying down, feeling hopeless in the gutter, because her father has fallen ill and only one shop can make the remedy that will cure him. The catch is that the girl needs to find the ingredients herself but she doesn't have money or knowledge of where to look. This sounds like a job for the savior. So first I have to go to the Chocobo clerk lady to find out which ingredients I need. But she's not here. I started this quest too early and she hasn't set up shop yet. 
You see, the NPCs in Lightning Returns have schedules. Keeping in mind that I'm still using chronostasis to freeze the flow of time so that I can delay the apocalypse, it's kind of annoying that I have to purposefully wait for things to happen. It's just, I didn't even see this chocobo lady until my third pass through the city. Imagine all the other things I must be missing, since the game isn't kind enough to have everything spawn at 6am. But okay, what ingredients do I need to find? A thunderclap cap, a Shaolan Gui shell, and a mandragora root. Okay, where the fuck do I find that? She never tells me, and neither does Hope. You open up the menu and it reminds you what you need to find, but never hints at a destination. Going by the names, I would assume that they're all pieces of loot that enemies drop. And no, they're not. It took me seven in-game days to finally solve this quest. I managed to stumble across two of the items by pure accident, but the last piece, the Mandragora Root, eluded me. And when I finally found it, the solution kinda pissed me off. So there's a grocer stand in Luxurian, and there are two grocers standing in front of it. I talked to one of them on my initial pass, and it turned out they sold regular items. Okay, nothing amazing. My inventory was full, and I didn't feel the need to talk to the second grocer. They're right next to each other, so I just assumed that they were selling the same stock. And no! Even though they're both titled Grocer, one of them is a special NPC who only exists when this quest is active. I had a 50-50 chance of solving this right away. Hell, it was pure luck that I even discovered the solution because I was just walking through trying to get an extra potion! <sighs> okay, so that's one quest I couldn't do. Next, I discovered a soldier who warned me that a dragon was loose in the city. Well, don't worry, I'm the savior! Oh wait, it's a three-star difficulty fight. Well, maybe it's not as bad- It annihilated me. I'm too weak because I haven't been solving quests and I'm nowhere near ready to kill this thing. But don't worry, I didn't get a game over. Instead, the game penalized me by eliminating an hour from the countdown. Fantastic. So in the next quest, I run into a girl who has to maintain all of the clocks in the city, but rather than do her fucking job, she makes lightning do it! Well okay, if there are only three or four- THIRTEEN?! I have to find thirteen clocks?! Come on! I have to go around the entire city all over again! No, scratch that! Multiple times, because these clocks are so easy to miss! Why is this city arranged in a circle? Why aren't there shortcuts in the middle to help me zip around town faster? And why wouldn't they mark the clocks on my map? Why must I wander aimlessly in a game with a fucking time limit? Next I find another weird looking priest and he wants me to find more collectibles, oh god. But wait, this one's easy. He tells me to find three red chests and I've already memorized where they are since I've been through these streets a million times. Finally, I can actually increase lightning stats. Where's the quest giver? He's gone! What? Where did he go? No! Well, it's official. I've brought out the cherry whiskey. Because I've only been playing for about four or five hours and I am just exhausted. The priest left because of his schedule. He goes away when the sun sets, which means I have to return the next day if I want to cash in my stat boosts. One of the biggest problems with this game's open world design is that you just never know where or when a quest is going to happen. One time I'll go into a courtyard and nothing will be there. But then I go back at a later date and oh my god, a talking cat! I'm Duffy. I'm a talking cat. It's by total accident that I even know this exists. Because they don't put quest locations on the map. Why the hell not? It just baffles me that they made Hope the Kodak guy, your eyes and ears on the ground. He's supposed to be monitoring everything that's going on, and he can't just be like, Hey Light, I'm getting really weird energy readings from the courtyard. I'll mark it on your map. That's all you need to do. That's what happens in Dead Rising. There's a guy who phones Frank West whenever he spots something interesting on the security cameras. And when you become aware of this, it gets added to your mission list. Then you can see where on the map this side quest is, as well as add a tracker so that a pointy arrow can show you the way. I never had trouble finding things in Dead Rising. Or the Yakuza series, because when you're in a big city location that you're completely unfamiliar with, 
it's nice to just be able to open the map and see where the side quests are. Especially when the game is incredibly charming and memorable. I'm not gonna remember the red chest guy, that's for sure. The only time you get a quest marker is for the main missions, and oh yeah, I never found that fourth number. You wanna know why? Because it's in a section of the city known as the Warren, a slum tucked away in the northeast corner that is only open to the public from midnight to 6 a.m. It's only open for six hours, and there's no other way to get in. Just, ugh. You told me the quest wouldn't start until 6 a.m. You told me that girls were being killed every day. Luxurian's quest was the mandatory introduction of the game. You encouraged me to solve it, and then prevented me from doing so for another 18 hours. In a game where every second counts because of a time limit! Why would I go explore another location in the meantime, when I know that taking a train to and back would cost me two to three hours? It's like the game kept saying, yeah, that's pretty annoying, but how can we inconvenience the player more? This design bugs the hell out of me. I think what I found most insulting was the triviality of it all. You're telling me lightning the most powerful heroine in the Final Fantasy universe, a woman blessed with the power of God himself, can't scale a 20-foot wall. In a city with ladders and plenty of rooftops that Noel himself takes advantage of, she can't scale a 20-foot wall. Even though she has Moon Jump, even though she can Cirque du Soleil off of falling meteors, even though the game opened with her perched on top of a clock tower like she's goddamn Batman, she can't scale a 20-foot wall. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Whatever. So I went to Yusnan to do a different main quest. I had to meet a worker at this entrance of this factory at 6 p.m. on the dot. The problem was, I initiated this conversation a little too late, and now it was 6.30 and I had no more chronostasis. I ran as fast as I could, but it hit 7 just before I talked to the guy. And so... Here's my ticket. Good enough? Damn right it's good enough for me. But can't you read? Showtime starts at 6. I had to wait another 23 hours. In 2014, this was the moment where I gave up. I turned off the game, went into the settings, and deleted it with no hesitation. None whatsoever. I hated it. Hate, 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 hated it! And I gotta say, returning to this game for the retrospective brought all of those feelings back. The first 10 hours were just as miserable as I remembered, and being able to articulate why has been so therapeutic. I feel like a giant weight has been lifted off my shoulders. <laughs> God, just imagine when I finally talk about Star Fox Zero. But yeah, now you know why I hated this game for years. I covered Lightning Returns in the retrospective partly to rant about it, but also to illustrate how Final Fantasy hasn't felt the same since the mid-2000s. These just aren't the games that I grew up with. But hey, I've gone this far. If I'm making a video about it, I might as well finish the game this time. And now that I've finally experienced everything this title has to offer, the last 10 minutes of ranting should serve as a cautionary tale. Sometimes, you need to make a good first impression. I quit this game because Luxurian is one of the most boring, bland, needlessly frustrating open worlds I've ever played. But man, if only I had started with the Dead Dunes. One of the four locations in Nova Chrysalia, the Dead Dunes is a giant desert. It's sand and rocks as far as the eye can see, where lightning can enter a whole bunch of ruins and find lost treasures. In the middle of this map lies a bandit camp, and it's here you'll find... Perfect timing. Glad you could make it. Took you long enough, didn't it? Fang. Hey, I know you! Yes, Fang is back, awake from her crystal slumber, and leading an expedition to find a magical relic known as the Holy Clavis. Unfortunately, her team hasn't had much luck finding the thing, because certain ruins can only be opened with the power of our Maker. You're on a mission from God now. Right, savior? Since the location of the clavis is brimming with chaos energy, Lightning agrees to help Fang find it. And until you do, Fang actually joins you as a guest party member. Huh, I guess Lightning doesn't fight by herself all the time. 
And this is why I absolutely recommend starting with the Dead Dunes on your first playthrough. Not only can she distract enemies and take a lot of the pressure off of you, but she can't die and she deals out a decent amount of damage in battles. When you're just getting the hang of things, it's nice to have a little extra support. And speaking of battles, I guess it's important to debunk a misconception about the growth system. Because you're in a desert and not a city, there aren't too many people around, which means there's only a few side quests you could realistically do. But I need to get stronger! What's the point in fighting monsters if you don't improve with the battles? Even ignoring the intrinsic experience of getting better with practice, None of these battles are pointless. Gil is important to buy new equipment, and the loot that these monsters drop are all specific to their enemy type. Like whenever I defeat one of Stephen King's Langoliers, it will 100% guaranteed drop a niblet hairball. And while I normally wouldn't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole, it is essential to raising your power. And it's all because of our favorite Chocobo chick. Chocoboco? It sure has been a long time, hasn't it, Lightning? Yes, Chocolina is back, and this time around she's managing the Canvas of Prayers, a bulletin board located at every train station in Nova Chrysalia. It manifests people's wishes into words, and you can deliver things they seek here in order to soothe their souls. They're very much just like regular side quests, except 95% of the time, the only thing they want is loot that enemies drop. You see where I'm going with this? Fighting the niblets on their own isn't making me stronger, but if I deliver six of their hairballs to the bulletin board, well, look at that. HP plus 10, strength plus 1. I can reliably grow my character, thank God. Now don't get me wrong, I still would have preferred a proper level up system. I'm sure they designed it this way to maintain some kind of gameplay balance. There's only so many requests you can fulfill, so there's no way you'll get overpowered on the first playthrough. Sometimes you spend hours of gameplay never seeing any real growth because of this. Like if you go to the Wildlands, you can find yourself fighting in the fields, fighting in the forest, in the mountains, in the temple. You stray so far from where the train station is and it takes ages to cash your prize. The battles are fun, but you never feel like you're actually getting stronger. Especially when Day 7 arrives and the enemies actually level up themselves. Something I only knew about thanks to the glossary section. Ugh. But coming back to the Dead Dunes, leveling up there was quick and easy. Why? Because it's the only map with a fast travel system. As soon as you enter the place, you stumble upon a red cactuar statue. And when you find another, it creates a link that allows you to teleport between them with no time loss at all. So I could be deep in a dungeon, tearing up skeletons with Fang, and then I stumble upon a new statue. Just like that, I can instantly return to the train station and grow my stats. A wonderful convenience that cuts down on backtracking, and thus makes exploration a lot easier. I actually enjoyed raiding the tombs, and I didn't even download the Tomb Raider DLC! Now that I wasn't worrying about schedules and missing NPCs and stuff, I just enjoyed exploring the place, battling fun new enemy types, and finding random trinkets that might help me later. Something I really appreciate about Lightning Returns is that you can preemptively solve quests without actually knowing about them. Like in the Dead Dunes, I stumble upon a tiny little robot who's been separated from their masters because it lacks the oil necessary to move around. Well, I was just wandering earlier, and I found tons of oil in a whole bunch of different spots. So when the quest started, I already had the oil, and I immediately solved it. Ah, I feel so lubricated once again. Then it opens the door, and oh god, his masters have been dead for decades. And then I get the robot's soul? What? Can even a robot possess something like a soul? Two base units have a soul. But this is far from the only instance. When I went to Yusnan, I managed to find a circle of imps just hanging outside the city. I defeated them and got myself a music satchel. I didn't know what its purpose was. It was an unsellable key item. A few in-game days later, I finally revisited the city when it was daytime, and I managed to meet a musician who was missing her mentor, a man who misplaced his music satchel. Well, I picked that up hours ago, so I just gave it to him and boom! The quest is immediately solved. Not every game does this. Sometimes you play something like Mega Man ZX and you have to initiate the quest before the thing you need to find will actually spawn on the map. Imagine if I could just clean out a level in one go. 
how much time I'd save, how convenient that would be. Well, in this game, I can find the Crim Mushroom before the doctor asks me to. I can buy this guy's plush doll in advance. And, yeah, I can get the ingredients for the girl's father before talking to her. As I discovered in the New Game Plus Hard Mode, when you know what you're doing, multitasking becomes a thing of beauty. It's a speedrunner's wet dream since they can completely optimize their schedules thanks to this freedom. The only roadblock is that you need to know these things exist. And since this game never wants to warn you about quests, that can be annoying sometimes. The Dead Dunes, however, was great. The quests had chill requirements and even more relaxed schedules. Also, I love that you can go to the top of a hill and lightning slides with the sand whenever she goes downward. Whee! Sorry, I just find that very fun. Wait, did I just say Lightning Returns is fun? No, 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 no. It's a garbage game made by garbage people. I've hated it for years. Even though I never finished it. But still, it's trash. So let's move on and talk about a new location. The Wildlands must suck. After all, it doesn't have fast travel like the Dunes do. So it must be tedious and annoying and... Eh, it's not even that bad, honestly. First off, this is one of the prettiest locations in the game. I loved the forest. The trees are so huge that you can't even see the top. Every morning, the place is enveloped with a beautiful mist. And in the daytime, the lighting engine really makes the place pop. It reminded me of all the camping trips I've experienced in Canada. The Wildlands is home to the Temple of Etro, and this place has an incredible presence no matter where you are on the map. Looking at it from the field definitely gave me vibes of the original Final Fantasy. I was remembering that moment when the Four Warriors of Light crossed the bridge. They defeated Garland, but the adventure had just begun. Who knows what monsters they'll face next, what dangers and trials they'll have to overcome. So they take one last look at the city of Canaria before venturing into the unknown. The Temple of Etro is definitely an unknown element. I don't know what the hell's in there, but I definitely want to find out. And the building just gets bigger and bigger the closer you approach, until finally you're at this rickety old bridge facing a colossus of a structure. If scenery can tell a story, then this is a damn good one. Also, the Temple of Etro is by far the hardest part of the game. It's covered in a poisonous miasma, so you're always taking damage. The flans here are so freaking strong that I would heavily recommend putting on fire-resistant accessories. Especially since you don't want to waste your items for the 30-minute climb, which culminates with what I consider the hardest boss in the game. It's super tough, but you know what? Coming off of the last two games, this dungeon was ironically a breath of fresh air. The world design of Lightning Returns can be pretty damn cool sometimes. I'll just be walking through and oh wow, look at that! I remember you, Sonic the Falci. The only place I thought looked ugly was Luxurian. The city is entirely brown and gray, and it feels like the buildings were purposefully arranged to hide sunlight. Seriously, I can't tell you the amount of times I was talking to someone for a side quest, and the only thing that popped on screen were the white subtitles. It's supposed to be two in the afternoon here! Why is it so dark? Luxurian is the divine city of light, not darkness. Could've fooled me! Sometimes I wonder if Luxurian was the last location they playtested. This game came out pretty quick after the last one, so you can definitely see some cut corners. Like this establishing shot of a very low-poly palace. And then there's the animals! In the last game, we saw a kitty cat that looked pretty darn adorable. In this game, whoa, put her back in, she's not done yet! And then we get to the dogs, who became an internet meme on Twitter almost immediately. Oh god! Look at it! That is one derpy, low-poly dog. And no, you cannot pet the dog in Lightning Returns. Boo! Since I've talked visuals, I might as well talk about the music as well. If I had to rank them, this game's soundtrack is above the original, but it's nowhere near as awesome as 13.2 was. It's the finale of the series, the end of the world as we know it, so it gets a little more serious and doesn't have as much variety. A lot of soft pianos, some choir pieces, just moody ambiance all around. 
but it is more catchy than the first game, and I think it really shines with the battle themes. It's alright, but 13-2 is still the king. Yeah, I did end up enjoying the Wildlands, although it did still annoy me here and there with the schedules and the backtracking. Because I don't have a fast travel system and the teleport ability costs way too much EP, I find myself hoofing it from the field to the forest, back to the field, to the canyon, back to the forest again. It is so slow compared to the last two games and you will get extremely familiar with these locations. It'd just be nice if the maps were a little smaller or at least had multiple routes. Yusnan may as well be a straight line. Aside from the staircase behind the Colosseum, there are no alternate routes at all. So every time I want to do a quest related to the town square, I have to go through the whole town, past the Cactuar statue, get my quest, run back past the Cactuar, accomplish my task, run past the Cactuar, get another quest, return past the Cactuar, I get a new dress and back past the Cactuar, like you know what I'm saying? Also, you have a stamina meter this time around, so every time I run somewhere, I have to make sure I stop sprinting just before the bar drains, or else lightning will run out of energy and walk slowly. Yay. This game still makes dumb decisions. In the Wildlands, the main quest centers around restoring a chocobo to health after it got mauled by a monster. It's the only chocobo I can ride, and I need to reach locations that only it can glide to. At one point, I found a flower, but I couldn't interact with it. So I move on and eventually find a chocobo tamer who tells me that chocobo wounds can be healed if they eat a special flower. Hey, I know where that is! I figured now that I've talked to her, Lightning will get the bright idea to pick it up this time. And no! She comments on it but doesn't actually collect the thing. Huh? After many quests, I finally get enough food to feed the chocobo with, so it perked up and now I can ride it. However, it's still hurt and cannot glide. Oh, so I had to wait until it could walk, and then take it to the flower. I traveled to this flower twice for no reason. I didn't even know the Chocobo's recovery was in stages. Why couldn't I just pick it up? Ugh. It just felt like there was always something getting in the way. I like exploring the dead dunes, but having doors open and close every single hour is meaningless. There's no puzzle to solve, you're just wasting my time. Oh damn, vines that only show up at night are blocking my pathway. Guess I'll just go around them since there are two pathways. This sure adds a lot to the gameplay, boy howdy. Call me impatient, but I just hate being prevented access to a place because of an arbitrary roadblock. The slums of Luxurian are only open for 6 of the 24 hours, and because so many quests happen in there, you find yourself stopping whatever you're doing so that you can be inside at night. Man, I really want to find these Moogles, but shoot, it's 10pm. Better head to the train station now so I don't waste time. I would have teleported to Luxurian, but I only have so much EP. I only get a refill at 6am unless I fight monsters, but that will take quite a while, even with the bigger, harder enemies. I would love to kill the big ones faster, but I can't upgrade my abilities. 
Something I haven't mentioned yet is that you can actually boost the power of your attacks. Every town has a sorcery shop where you fuse abilities together. Doing so will increase their damage as well as reduce the ATB that they drain from the meter. Now you can't just fuse the fire spell with the ice spell, you need to fuse it with another fire. And again, abilities only come from treasure chests or as a drop when you kill enemies. But I did gather enough of the same types and eventually I would max it out. Sorta. Spells come in levels. So I'm not just mixing fire, I'm mixing level 1 fire. But occasionally I have been picking up the odd level 2 spell here and there. So I can make my abilities stronger, I just don't know how. Like they didn't say anything, I even double checked the tutorial again and no dice. Then one day I just go into a sorcery shop and oh guess what? You can level up abilities now. What? Why? What did I do? I didn't do anything. Turns out, you cannot upgrade abilities until you have reached day 6. Something the game never tells you at all. But actually, that's not true! Because in order to level up a spell, you also require these special items known as Malice Stones. You can't buy Malice Stones in a shop, you have to collect them from enemies. And they don't start carrying Malice Stones until day 7. What's the point of unlocking a feature if I can't actually use it? This is some original 13 level bullshit here. This is exactly like when the Crystarium opened up, but it cost way too many points to grow the new classes. And the whole time I'm annoyed because I'm just thinking to myself, why wasn't everything unlocked from the get-go? Lightning Returns starts out way harder than most Final Fantasies. You have to find the good abilities like Deep Protect and Poison. You have to do quests to get stronger. You need money to buy better weapons and shields. At the start, you're easy pickings, and you've got to be choosy with the battles you come across. You see a behemoth, you fucking run! But imagine if enemies were always dropping Malastones. If I could boost my attack to level 2 as soon as possible. It would have alleviated so much of the pressure, given me more gameplay freedom. Instead, it feels like the first game again. Sorry, you can't get stronger until Chapter 3. Well, whatever, right? I'll stockpile all these level 1 spells, and then when day 7 comes, I can just get tons of Malastones and tons of level 2, level 3 spells, no problem. So through the course of the game, I'm not running from battles, I'm fighting everything I come across and getting tons of abilities for it too. And then, I stumble upon a very purple wolf. It's way harder than the usual riffraff, but it's nothing I can't handle. So why was he purple? What was so different about that guy? EXTERMINATED! DEFEATED EVERY GORGONOPSID! Wait, what?! What have I done?! Remember, this is a world where no new life can be born. If these critters can't breed and have babies, then there's only so many left. This also means you have limited opportunities to get Malice Stones and abilities. If your playstyle is extremely grindy, you may find yourself eliminating enemies from the field. And yeah, they're genuinely gone. If I kill every single flan, I'm not going to see them ever again. What are you, Lightning? I wish I knew. Believe me. I've taken a lot of lives. More than I can count. If I had any humanity left, I would have been crushed by the guilt by now. This system, again, seems to have been made to maintain some kind of gameplay balance. The longer the game goes on, the harder the enemies get, but also the better the prizes. If you eliminate the flans before day 13, then you're not getting the level 2 or level 3 blizzard spells that might help you at the end of the game. But then again, if I kill all the monsters early, I can get some really cool prizes. Like, I didn't kill everything, but I did want to see what happened if I took out every single behemoth. It was tiring, it was boring, it was repetitive, but eventually I did finish them off and got the best prize ever. I got to keep their big-ass purple sword, and it was one of the best weapons in the game. I used that sword in the finale, and I kept it all the way into New Game Plus, where it still cut things up like a hot knife through butter. So I got a really good payoff, even though it was dull and tedious to collect. There's actually a side quest where an old man wants you to commit complete total genocide on the entire island, to eliminate every single damn monster in the game. Even us ageless humans, we still fall prey to illness and injury. Eventually, there will be a last of us too. So, 
sorry, I don't have the patience to kill every single monster. I'm sure it gives lightning a lot of power, but goddamn, what a tedious way of extending gameplay. It's funny, the following year we would see the release of an indie game that also played with the idea of killing everything. That game was Undertale. And at least there, the repetitive, uninteresting gameplay was the point. The story changes to reflect your actions, and it becomes a fascinating meta-commentary on the kind of players who obsessively complete RPGs. Something that would be dull in any other game ends up leaving a lasting impression. The extinction mechanic is a novel idea, but it has nothing to say. It slows down a game that's already dragging itself out with backtracking and stat-reliant quests. After beating Lightning Returns, I started a New Game Plus run, and it was boring because I felt I had seen everything the game had to offer. Despite the fact that enemies were harder, and now there was a new weapon upgrade system. Something teased in the first playthrough, but you could never actually do. Ay. The quests themselves just aren't that memorable. Most of the time you're just killing a monster or you're finding a whole bunch of collectibles. And even when you do find a quest that does something different, the gameplay isn't anything to write home about. Like, oh no! A farmer's sheep have run off and now I have to herd them back with my chocobo! A situation that I've played out before in dozens of games. Another time, a kid wanted me to race him to the train station on foot, and because I'm a tall adult, I wiped the floor with this kid and there was no challenge whatsoever. Thanks for the free XP, I guess, but what does this add to Lightning's character? Or to the story? Everyone's so lifeless and boring. I thought this was a good way to add a little excitement. Show people how to have fun! I guess that's one takeaway, but I don't even agree with it. Yeah, there are a few sad sacks because Lightning needs quests to do, but it feels like everyone's just down for the end of the world. Many in these lands worship Etril, the goddess of death. They pray to eventually return to her side, which in their creed is the same as ceasing to exist. And yeah, I guess when you think about it, this isn't the end. It's a reset. God is taking everyone to a new world to return to the natural order of things. So people aren't afraid, they're partying and dancing and just enjoying their lives. Except when they're not. Because apparently, this chef won't open his soul to me until he has cooked a master recipe. About the only dish I can cook is behemoth steak on a campfire. What I need is much simpler than that. I require only a few small but vital ingredients. Which you can't find. All I gotta do is find a few apples, bada bing bada boom, his soul is mine, and I won't remember this quest a year from now. On the roof. Really? You're not content with your life because you've misplaced a ball? You're supposed to be 500 years old! Just buy a new one! You know, I wouldn't mind the simplicity of the quests if the characters were engaging. But I don't care about the pickpocket. I don't care about the cosplay girl. I did more than 50 quests without a guide and I'm not gonna remember any of these characters. Meanwhile, everyone and their mother has already compared this game to The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Another game about the end of the world that had a time limit, as well as characters operating on their own schedules. But these people actually interact with each other. They actually do different things in multiple places, instead of just fading out of existence until they need to return to their one spot. There's just so much more drama and nuance in the day-to-day -day life of these characters as they brace themselves for the end of all things. Everyone who played that game remembers the tragic relationship between Anju and Cafe. That's something that's going to be sticking with me until the day I die. Oh, and Cafe? He's an adult stuck in the body of a child. And Majora's Mask does way more with that concept than Lightning Returns does. When I play a game like Fallout New Vegas, there's just a better sense of community. Yeah, the people have schedules. Yeah, I do quests for them. But there's just so much more to them than that. Their allegiances, their friends, what kind of secrets I can find inside their bedroom. Just... I don't know. Maybe I'm making a mountain out of a molehill here. I mean, I wouldn't call these quests terrible. It's certainly better than talking to a bunch of floating statues, that's for sure. At least all these voice-acted interactions give Lightning a little extra personality. Choco Chocobo, it's time to tell. What are the magic words? Meow meow, Choco Chow. I'm getting the feeling you're not as amused as I am by this whole thing. That was by far the most embarrassing thing I've ever done in my life. Occasionally they're interesting, and hey, at least I'm not spending most of my time hunting down frogs and dog tags. <coughs> but hey, it's my video, and I'm just trying to articulate why the quests didn't work for me. I find them pretty average, and I'm not likely to remember them unless they were frustrating on a gameplay level. And on that topic, 
I'm so conflicted. The battle system is really fun. There were plenty of times that I loved exploring the world and setting up my equipment and playing dress up. But at the same time, the quests can be really annoying. You backtrack constantly, and the game is always ruining my fun with roadblocks. It's not an easy title to recommend because you really gotta put in the work for this one. There are so many caveats. Do you like time limits? Do you like action RPGs? Do you like the 13 universe? It's not surprising that this is the worst selling game of the trilogy. Some people like this game, and a lot of people hate it. I used to be in that camp! But, having come back and finished it, it's not that bad. I kind of like it for what it is, and I never thought I'd say that coming back. So yeah, when it comes to Lightning Returns, play it at your own discretion. But let's wrap this thing up, huh? Now I'm going to finally talk about the story. Why did I wait until the end of the video to start getting into this? To be honest, I just don't think there's that much to cover. Once you solve the main quests, that's it. You go to the final day, you enter the last dungeon, and then you beat the game. And the main quests are mostly just Lightning interacting with a familiar character, helping them with their depression or a problem they have, and then you collect their soul. And these characters don't have any follow-up quests. They just stand around for the rest of the game, waiting for the ending to happen. Now being an open world game, I can see why they handled the story this way. Again, I like the fact that you can tackle any of the major quests in whatever order that you want. And because there's a time limit, they can't make these missions too long or they run the risk of stressing players out. Well, more than usual. But of course the consequence is that there's hardly any story at all. They do what they can, like having cutscenes trigger every time you return to the Ark. Sarah, it won't be long now. I'm coming home soon, aren't I? No, wait! When I saw Sarah, I didn't feel anything at all. It's like, whatever love I'd had for her was gone from my heart. Oh, Lightning. Now, when I covered the original game, I said that I actually enjoyed Lightning's character. And I kind of downplayed my affection by gushing about how she was a confident badass. Yeah, she's fun to watch. Yeah, she kicks ass. But there's always been a little bit more to her character than people give credit. Being an orphan, Sarah is the only family that Lightning has. She was protective of her and didn't want her ending up with a burnout idiot. Then on her birthday, she finds out that she's marrying a burnout idiot. Worst birthday ever. This causes Sarah to run out crying, and that's the last Lightning sees of her until she gets taken by the foul sea. And Lightning is just riddled with guilt that this was their final moment together. So against all odds, she breaks from the Guardian Corps to storm the place and take her back. Why didn't I listen? I'm so sorry. Please let me in. Please? People think Lightning is this stoic warrior with no personality, but she's incredibly emotional. Sweet dreams. Sweet dreams? She's not sleeping! <clears throat> it's over! After everything that happened, she had every reason to be cynical and mad and completely closed off to everyone around her. Her personality made sense to me. And yet, there's this delicate side, this feminine side, that you just never get with other Final Fantasy protagonists. You and I are partners, Hope. And as much as people remember her punching the shit out of Snow, she forgave him fairly quickly. Seeing how much he cares about Sarah, Lightning has no doubts about their marriage. She's a very human character in a game that has Vanille in it. <laughs> I feel like most people think of her as this selfish bitch purely because the storytelling didn't give context to what came before. The plot keeps happening out of order and the game isn't very fun to play, so people don't really appreciate the good character stuff that the game does have. So again, I like Lightning. She is a good character. In the first game. But in the sequels, I don't know, man. Ever since she became Etro's guardian, she turned into this alien who waxes poetic every chance she gets. Each reunion is a twist of the knife. The joy is ephemeral. It leaves fear in its wake. Humanity's great frailty. We prefer past happiness to future uncertainty. And now we get to the third game, and Lightning has been stripped of her emotions by God. I have to wonder how much that influenced the voice acting. Mog. I'm glad you're all right. I was worried about you. It all started back when... Wait, never mind. 
I trust you. You're on my side. Please, stop talking. By the way, on console, the Japanese dub is actually DLC that you need to pay money for. Oh, <laughs> Square Enix never change. What happened to Lightning is what happens to a lot of Final Fantasy characters. They get over-idolized and milked to death, and the original intent of the character seems to get lost in the shuffle. Now she does have a blank stoic personality. Although I guess thanks to the story, it's not out of place? I'm more powerful than I ever was, but it came with a price. I'm not even sure if I'm human anymore. I'm going to fight for as long as it takes, give whatever it takes, even if it's my humanity. And that's really the big culprit for me. Every character you liked from the 13 universe is now very different. Hope was always the most annoying character, but now he's even worse because he talks like a fucking robot the whole time. Noel, a guy who's willing to sacrifice himself for the good of the future, is now a guy who sits idly by while women get murdered in the streets. He knew full well what the children of Etro were doing and never intervened until Lightning entered the picture. Then I shouldn't have waited, should I? I could have found you and saved their lives. No shit, Noel. Vanille, the woman who became Ragnarok and Shattered Cocoon, is still dwelling on this all these years later. Despite being part of the crew that defeated Bartandalus and saved the world, she still feels the need to sacrifice herself and atone for what she's done. But we already went over this in the first game! You think you die and everything will be sugar and rainbows? This time I'm making a promise. I will keep Cocoon safe. Damn it, Vanille, you weren't responsible! <gasps> I was! Vanille's character should be above all this. It's regression. But hell, at least she has more screen time than Zaz does. Because man, I don't think the writers even know what to do with this character. When you first meet him, he's lost all hope because his son Dodge has been in a coma ever since time froze. Asleep for five centuries. Why? Because somehow, Dodge's soul got splintered off into five different jewel fragments, and those fragments have been scattered across Nova Cursalia. I don't know why. At first I thought it was a horrible prank performed by the character Lumina, but she denies it. Did God do it? If so, why would Buna Velza torment Zaz for centuries? Either way, you want to know how long Zaz is on screen? When you first meet him, he explains Dodge's situation in exactly one minute. A whopping one minute long cutscene. Then he leaves, never to be seen again until you find all the fragments. When you wrap up the quest, there's a cute little cutscene where Zaz wakes his son by playing with a toy airship. Duh, that's heartwarming. But then it's over after five minutes. You get his soul, and that's it. I think Lightning exchanges maybe four lines with the guy. She spends more time talking with the food critic than she does one of the original game's party members. And when the ending happens, everybody shows up during the final day. Noel, Fang, Vanille, Snow, everyone, except Zaz. He's only in the game for six minutes, and that is inexcusable. Imagine being a fan of the 13th story up to this point, and it just doesn't deliver on the most basic fan service. The fan service that matters, anyway. But hey, I'm gonna give credit where I can because some of it does work. I thought the reunion between Lightning and Snow was the best cutscene in the game. After Sarah's death, Snow spent the rest of his life building up Yusnan. Having gotten branded by a foul sea again, he uses his Lassie powers to enrich everyone's lives and becomes the patron. He's in charge of Yusnan, and he spends all of his time sulking in a palace because he was unable to prevent what Caius did. Suddenly, the most optimistic character of the original group is now a broken man. When chaos energy starts to form in the middle of the palace, Snow decides to eliminate it by sacrificing himself. You're looking for a way out, a death that's no different than suicide! How can you face Sarah after that? I know I'll never see her again. This is what I deserve! I know it! And you know it! She never stopped believing in you. No matter how far away your journey took you, or how long you stayed apart, she thought she would be with you again! I know she still believes it now! This is one of the few times that lightning comes alive. Allie Hillis and Troy Baker just nail this scene. I also like that it's a role reversal of how they acted in the first game, with Lightning being the cynic and Snow the optimist. Some scenes really work. It really depends how much you're willing to suspend your disbelief about the passage of time. Would Noel truly still be hung up on Yule 500 years later? Enough to want to kill Sarah's sister to reunite with her? 
Zaz hasn't seen lightning since the end of the first game, and he's not even shocked or surprised to see her. Everyone should be like, Oh my god, you are alive! We haven't seen you in so long! The only character done justice, in my opinion, was Fang. She acts the way her character always did, and the fact that she joins you as a guest party member means she gets a lot of screen time. But enough about the old cast, I should probably talk about the new character. In the opening cutscene, we get introduced to Lumina, a mischievous troublemaker who happens to have the exact same appearance as Sarah. But she does have a different voice. Hope, are you there? No, no, no. Hope can't hear you or see you. You're invisible. Do you know why? Because we're inside you. Spooky, huh? This girl has some really bizarre powers that allow her to do whatever she wants. She can teleport, summon giant monsters, and even go inside Lightning's head to have a conversation with her. I swear that kid is a demon. She can also restore people's souls like she does with Zaz and Dodge. Well, that's nice. She's a very neutral character. Sometimes she's on your side, and other times she's actively attacking you. She's always inserting herself into every situation, laughing and smiling with chaotic glee as the devil figure of your conscience. He sacrificed himself to keep the city safe, and his only reward was to turn into a monster. So why don't you just set him free already? Don't you think that's what Sarah would want? You spend a lot of time with Lumina, and this girl seems to know all of Lightning's true feelings. Especially when it comes to God. I don't have anything to hide. He's promised to bring Sarah back. Right, right. That's very convincing. Keep those feelings hidden and play the loyal little servant. You want to be as cold as the steel in your sword. Maybe he just threw her soul away and let it be swallowed up by the chaos. If he lied, then I don't care if he is a god. I'll destroy him. him. <laughs> That's a fun development. I like that Lightning is actually suspicious of God himself. I mean, to be fair, he does seem like an asshole. So Fang's quest this entire time was to find the Holy Clavis, an object that can summon all of the souls of the dead to one location. When she and Vanille woke up from their crystal slumber, somehow, Vanille gained the ability to communicate with the dead. It's then that they get acquainted with Luxurian's Chantry, The Order. On the final day, the Order plans to use the Holy Clavis to bring all of the souls together. Since Vanille can listen to them, she's the perfect candidate to perform the Soul Song. Seems harmless, right? Well, no. Fang discovers that anyone who performs the Soul Song will sacrifice their own life. And after hearing this information, Vanille still wants to go through with it. Because to her, it's for the greater good and it's what she deserves. You bastards want to take it from me? At the end of the Dead Dunes quest, the Order unleashes a monster to attack Lightning, and they sneak off with the Clavis. Now this wouldn't be that big of a deal, until we find out that the Clavis isn't just summoning the souls. Sid reigns. His soul has dissolved into the swirl of chaos. I take his form as a convenience, but I'm no more than a puppet. I am the speaker for the dead. So, somehow, the dead have entered Lightning's subconscious to inform her that the Chaos Energy isn't just a destructive energy force. It is the literal life stream of all the souls that have ever died. And if Vanille performs the Soul Song, all of those souls are going bye-bye. If you answer our prayer, it will mean defying Bonavelza. And apparently, God wants all of the dead people to be erased from existence. Hmm... We also discovered that the Chaos is super aggro and tainted because of Yule. Every time she died, she was in love with Caius, and her love for Caius distorted the life stream or some shit, I don't know. This is so convoluted and nonsensical. Things just happen in this game, and I'm tired of questioning it. The point is, it's Yule's fault that Lightning was even brought to Valhalla in the first place. I'm mentioning it now because this'll come up in the ending. Anyway, Lightning doesn't want to eliminate everyone's souls because they could erase Sarah. So on the final day, she and everyone else show up to stop the Soul Song ceremony. And they're successful in doing so. It's then that Lumina and Yule appear, and Lumina explains that Sarah's soul has been inside her all along. Because, somehow, Lightning stored Sarah's soul inside of herself when she entered her crystal sleep, 
And then, somehow, the soul left Lightning's body in the form of Lumina, who is a fusion of Sarah and Lightning. This is such Kingdom Hearts bullshit, and I hate it. <laughs> but oh noes! Buna Velza shows up in the body of Hope. Because it turns out, God has been inside Hope's body this whole entire time. What? Is that why he de-aged Hope? Because he wanted to be in the body of a teenager? Oh god. He captures all of Lightning's friends. He's mad that Lightning would save all those souls because these bastards ruined the world. In his new world, everyone will be stripped of emotion. Only then can the perfect utopia be created. And Lightning's like, nuh uh, you go to hell, God. I wasn't sure. Not until now. I thought that if you really were trying to save humanity, maybe I should help you instead of fighting you. But I'm sure now! You think you can slay God? You've made me strong enough! And then she single-handedly fights God. <laughs> because of course she does! Turns out having the power of God inside you puts you on equal terms with him. So she kicks his ass. And then, all of the collective souls of Grand Pulse, every single spirit on the planet, comes together to help Lightning form a giant energy sword. Know this, Benavelza. It wasn't just me that destroyed you. You've been defeated by a power that you never understood. It comes from the bonds of love that unite us. Together. We change the world. most anime thing that's ever happened in these games. It's so dumb and glorious, good lord. At the end, Caius and the numerous Yules show up. Since they're both so powerful in chaos energy, they are going to be the gods of death for the new world. And then good guy Caius decides to throw Noel a bone, and he literally gives him the Yule from their timeline. <laughs> Everybody gets a happy ending. Sarah's back from the dead, Hope is okay. Better than okay, because guess who's going to the new world with him? His mother. <laughs> I'm not even shitting you. Everyone who's ever died is back. And then everybody floats to the new world, which I guess Buna Velza created. And after the credits, we get an epilogue scene with Lightning. She's on a train wearing fashionable clothing, and then gets out to see this new world. It has airplanes and cars, and it kind of looks like our world. The people of Grand Pulse have come to Earth. And now Lightning can spend the rest of her days not as a soldier, but as a Louis Vuitton fashion model. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> that actually happened. That is a thing that actually happened in real life. Oh my god. And with that ridiculous finale, the 13 trilogy comes to an end. So to me, Lightning Returns is better than average. It's the most fun I've had gameplay-wise with this whole entire trilogy. The battle system is great, customizing Lightning is fun, and it definitely stands out among the rest of the series. Although sometimes for the wrong reasons. It's really hard to get into, and it's worth remembering that I initially gave up on this game. Too many annoying quests, the story isn't that great, and it feels like too often you need a guide to know what's going on. I won't say it's a bad game, but I can't just recommend it to anybody either. It was a really interesting experience to come back to. I know covering the 13 trilogy has been hard for some of my viewers, mainly because it was very negative. I know how whiny my voice can get. It's just such an inconsistent series. There are things about each game that I really like. I like the original game's cutscenes, I love 13.2's level design and soundtrack, and Lightning Returns has fantastic combat. I wish all three of these games could fuse together to form one amazing product. All you did was try your best. There's nothing wrong with that. It didn't turn out like I'd hoped, but it wasn't a mistake. That line right there? Yeah. I'd say that's about how I feel. This trilogy could have been better, but I'll happily play as Lightning in Dissidia. I'm still happy to see Snow in World of Final Fantasy, and I still like playing to the music in Theater Rhythm Curtain Call. There's plenty to appreciate from this universe. 
but obviously, it's been a bumpy ride. Remember, I don't like 13, but that's just me. I'm not the authority on Final Fantasy. I'm not some gatekeeper telling you what to think, and I don't think any less of the people who enjoy these games. I'm just a guy talking into a microphone with way too much time on his hands. In summation, you do you, 13 fandom. You do you. So the next game in the retrospective is going to be pretty different, and I'm not going to lie, it might take me a while to finish that video. You might be waiting half a year for that one. Uh, I'm going to be upgrading my computer, getting new capture software, and uh, it's going to be a learning experience. Uh, I'm still figuring out how I'm going to be recording the next project, but uh, I will say this. This will be the last video in the Final Fantasy retrospective that's in 720p. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know. I'm finally catching up with everyone else, but uh, I promise it'll be worth the wait because next time I'm going to be covering one of the best MMOs ever made. The negativity is over. Next time I look at Final Fantasy XIV, A Realm Reborn.